Hi everyone and welcome to Parenting with me, Annie Plachette Murphy. Well, bumps and bruises, even the occasional trip to the emergency room are part of growing up. And while we can't protect our kids from pain, we can do a lot to lessen the physical and emotional impact of an injury or illness simply by choosing our words carefully. Our guest today knows very well how hard it is to remain calm when your child is hurt. But her book, Verbal First Aid, Help Your Kids Heal from Fear and Pain and Come Out Strong, provides invaluable tools every parent and health practitioner should have. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Judith Simon Prager. You have this lovely, you know, almost formula in the book where you say what we think equals how we feel equals how we heal. Um, so just, just tell me quickly what, what's behind that formula. Well, whatever we're thinking, every thought that we have is a physiological reaction in our body. Just think about having a nightmare. You wake up from a nightmare and your palms are sweaty and your throat is dry and your heart is palpitating and you open your eyes and you're in your bedroom just where you love to be. So what? At, so do you turn around and go back to sleep? You know, for 20 <laughs> minutes. You go and you have a glass of water, you check right. the locks on the door, you go, to, you go to the bathroom, you turn on the television. Why? Because for 20 minutes a cascade of chemicals of adrenaline and cortisol and all of those chemicals that deal with fight or flight flood your body so that you can escape from a saber-toothed tiger. That's the way we were built. Right. However, we don't need that anymore. So what we want to do is instead put in those chemicals, find the words that actually can generate those chemicals of calm that begin the healing. And that's what verbal first aid is, physically and emotionally. You never think it's going to happen to you. A fire in your home, a heart attack, or life-threatening weather. But the truth is it can happen. And would you know what to do? I'm Bill Ritter, and over the next half hour, we're going to show you what to do to survive in emergency situations. This is information that could one day save your life or save the life of someone you love. Knowing the right thing to do in an emergency is, as we've seen, absolutely critical. But that includes saying the right thing in an emergency. We're talking about something called verbal first aid. Verbal first aid is a way of speaking so that you can influence the course of recovery. And the major rule is say what you want to have happen, not what you don't. The most important piece of this that's so really beautiful is that it can affect post-traumatic stress. When you say the right thing during a trauma, it doesn't become such a trauma. Judith Simon Prager is author of The Worst is Over, What to Say When Every Moment Counts. She travels the world training emergency personnel in rescue dialogue, but she says there are words of comfort we can all use. We all have occasion where there's a scary diagnosis, somebody has a nightmare, where the car in front of you skids off the road, where grandpa gr falls over grabbing his heart, or grandmother falls in with her hip and falls on the floor and knowing not to say, Grandpa, Grandpa, don't die, even though you love him. And he's thinking like, I'm just having pain, right? And you say, Grandpa, don't die. And he's thinking, could I die? When you say right. don't <laughs> die to someone, they hear die, and they figure that's what we're talking about, where they just thought they were hurt. In a fight or flight situation, a person who's very frightened is will listen to any authority figure who will tell them what to do. When you ask, especially a child or the elderly, but everyone, when you say, will you hold the bandage while I clean the wound? When you do that, they're not part of the problem, they're part of the solution. As soon as you raise them to that level where they're being helpful, it shifts the dynamic and they begin to feel better already. Well, if, if the rescuer asked me to help, I must be, you know. It, and it suddenly uh, empowers them so they're not feeling so powerless and so much a victim. They really literally can start their own healing if you can set them on the course. Today on Between the Lines, how to help your children heal and become stronger with Dr. Judith Simon Prager. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Dr. Prager was a past guest on Between the Lines with her groundbreaking book, The Worst is Over. 
Today she takes the lessons learned from that work and now applies it specifically to children. With her latest book, Verbal First Aid, she explores how words spoken to your child in times of crisis not only helps them heal, but gets them through the difficulties they encounter later in life. So it's a, it's a very broad range that verbal first aid, if enacted properly, can affect a person in a positive way. It affects the body, but I have a wonderful story about how it affected the spirit as well. I got a call from a fireman um, some time ago, and he said his mother had given him the worst is over, and he said he always knew that there were people, firemen, who had good be bedside manner. When they were at a, a scene of an accident, everything was calm, but he didn't know what they did. And his mother gave him the worst is over, and he read that book. And then the next day, he had to go to a car crash, and there was a mother and about a five-year-old in the car. So they weren't hurt badly, but the mother was easy to retrieve. The child was in the part of the car that had been so dented, they would have to use the jaws of life to get her out, screaming hysterically, frightened to death, and maybe slightly injured. And he said ordinarily he would be yelling, get the jaws of life, do this, do that, but he remembered verbal first aid. He slipped his hand into the car, right up, touched her knee where he could, and he said, I'm a daddy like your daddy, and I have a little girl just like you, and I'm going to take care of you as if you were my little girl. Everything got quiet. She stopped crying. Everything got calm. They got her out. And I said to him, even more than what you did at the spot, Every time she remembers this incident, instead of it being the worst thing that ever happened to her, she remembers the rescue. Sooner or later, chances are you'll be at the side of somebody who is in the middle of an emergency. And our guest this afternoon says, by simply saying the right words to that person, you can make all the difference in the outcome. And sometimes it's not even saying the right words. It's just having the right attitude and the, and the right uh, demeanor. Which is what verbal first aid is, the therapeutic suggestions that help somebody heal. Okay, so, so I come up to the accident. I'm there, and somebody's pinched mm -hmm. in the car. We can't get them out, and they're, they're in pain. Right. What am I supposed to say? Well, there's a magic phrase. That, that's why we named our book this magic phrase, and it is the worst is over. The worst is over is both true and calming because... You've already been hit by the car. You've already fallen off the building. You've already been burned in the fire. The worst is over. Now we start putting you back together again. So when a person realizes that, the chemicals that go through his body can start the inner healing. And that's what we're trying to do with verbal first aid. Regular first aid, you know, attends to the body. But we're talking about that whole mind body that we have, the inner healing. You know, there isn't a doctor in the world who can make your arteries grow back together again. There isn't a doctor in the world who can make your bone grow back together again. It's you, your body, that does it. And the images in your body send the chemicals that can do it. So we want to initiate that in somebody who's having a, uh, instead of having them be in fear when they make fearful chemicals. Just last month, I was here speaking at Children's Hospital of, of um, Seattle, uh, teaching doctors and nurses and... You should turn the mic on. Oh, turning the mic on would help, too. Okay. So, is this... Ah, okay. So, you didn't hear how much I love you, but I do. <laughs> and, um... Uh, so, last, just last month, in the, on the 19th, I was doing a, what they call Grand Rounds, which is training doctors how to speak verbal first aid and, and nurses and clinical people. And they just, they loved it. And it, it does my heart so much good to be able to share this. I, I just want you to know before I begin my talk that we did write a book, Verbal First Aid, Help Your Kids Heal From Fear and Pain and Come Out Strong. And it's really important to teach to talk to the next generation in this particular magical language that sets a course for healing. But I want you to know that the reason that I do this for me, the reason that I do this is because I believe when we understand that the way we speak to each other is not only heard by our ears, but by our bodies, by our spirits, and even by our memory. So that how we remember an event, especially in a time of crisis, how we remember it shapes the future, not just the moment of healing, but forever how we feel about it. We have to treat each other differently. We have to talk. I'm on a mission to help us understand that the very words and images of the things that shape the way we carry our memories, the way we, uh, the way we are about ourselves and each other in the world. So it's a bigger mission for me, but I, I wanted to address this first with you. So I thought I'd ask um, how many of you are, I can sort of see you now that, now that I'm getting used to the light, uh, how many of you have children? 
Great, great, great. How many of you care for children or work with children? How many of you ever were children? <laughs> oh, fabulous. I'd like to take a moment and introduce to you Judith Simon Prager, who is a clinical hypnotherapist with a PhD in psychology and has graciously come, agreed to come and help us learn some new tools and apply some tools we already have a little more precisely as we care for ourselves and care for patients. This woman hit her, had hit her head against the um, dashboard. She put her hand to her forehead and pressed in and she could feel it felt wet and it felt crunchy and she put her hand in and took her hand out and looked at it and didn't see anything and so when the police came and asked questions she was lucid and could answer the questions about the crash and who she was and who the driver was. Sometime later she saw herself and she saw how badly she'd hurt herself and she said to me I just didn't see red when I looked down I didn't see red if I had seen red I wouldn't have been able to say anything. So that was negative hallucination where she didn't see what was happening. We all have it. Women have it a lot when they're looking in their purse for something and they can't find it and they know it's there. And so they look again and they can't find it and they know it's there. And then they look a third time and there it is and it's been sitting there all along. So I was trying to find a corollary for men and I, uh, you know, and I, was, I couldn't think and I was thinking well maybe they, when they look in their drawers and they can't find it and then it got to be a joke because I, I meant desk drawers. But <laughs> I hope, I know. So I hope that when men look in their drawers they find what they're looking for. 